Welcome to Big Tent Live Events, the lockdown live online event series brought to you by Torch, the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities, as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, itself one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. My name is Wes Williams, and I'm a professor of French literature at the University of Oxford, a fellow of St Edmund Hall, and I'm also the Knowledge Exchange Champion here at Torch. The Big Tent live event series is our way of bringing together once a week researchers, students, performers and practitioners from across the different humanities disciplines. We're bringing you this event programme online while we're all keeping our distance and we hope that you're all safe and well during this difficult time. Our aim here is to explore together important subjects and ask challenging questions about areas such as the environment, medical humanities, ethics and AI, the public, the private, and the common good. And we will celebrate storytelling and music, performance and poetry, identity and community. If you would like to put forward any questions to our speakers during the event tonight, please pop them in the comments box in YouTube. We encourage you to submit these as early as possible, and I can then ensure that they inform and enrich the Q&A part of our discussion in about half an hour or so's time. Now, on to our excellent speakers tonight. It's an honor to host and to welcome Professor Judith Buchanan, Master of St. Peter's College in Oxford, and Professor John Wyver, Director of Screen Productions for the Royal Shakespeare Company. I embarrass them both by saying a bit about them. And as I do so, I hope it'll be clear why we thought it would be a good idea to bring them together to address this theme, this week's theme of arts and lockdown. Professor Judith Buchanan first is, as of this year, Master of St. Peter's College here in Oxford, having previously been Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the University of York. She's a Shakespearean and a film scholar, and her research focuses on Shakespearean performance histories and on silent cinema. Publications include Shakespeare on Film, published by Longman Pearson in 2005, Shakespeare on Silent Film, an excellent dumb discourse, CUP 2009, and The Writer on Film, Screening Literary Authorship, Polgrave, 2013. She has provided the expert voiceover commentaries for DVDs of silent films with the British Film Institute and the Tannhauser Film Corporation. She's also director of Silence Now, which works with actors, musicians, dancers, and venues of historical interest to bring silent cinema to contemporary audiences in fresh ways. She co-wrote and acted as Shakespeare advisor to the Kit Monkman feature film of Macbeth, which had its West End premiere in March 2018, and she's a champion for the value of collaborations that work across academia and the creative industries. Welcome, Judith. Professor John Wyver is Director, Screen Productions for the Royal Shakespeare Company, Professor of the Arts on Screen at the University of Westminster, and a writer, director, and producer with the independent production company Illuminations, which he co-founded in 1982. He's produced many notable theatre-based productions for film and television, including Richard II with Fiona Shaw in 1997, Hamlet with David Tennant in 1998, and Macbeth with Patrick Stewart in 1999, directed by Rupert Gould. And he is the producer of all the RSC live from Stratford-upon-Avon live theatre broadcasts into cinemas. And I should say long before lockdown made this something that we're much more used to now. His work as a producer has been honoured with a BAFTA award, an international Emmy and a Peabody. In other words, he was a pioneer in this field. His recent collaborations include a film of Gecko's Institute and a screen adaptation of Mike Bartlett's drama Albion from the Almeida Theatre, both of which are to be shown on BBC Four. His publications include Screening the Royal Shakespeare Company, A Critical History, published by Bloomsbury just last year. For the Royal Shakespeare Company, he is tasked with developing their future policy for broadcasting and digital distribution, and I'm sure he'll bring some of the thoughts related to that to our discussion today. Welcome again to you then, both John and Judith. Thank you once again for joining us as part of this series, and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Judith, to start the real discussion going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wes. And thank you also to Vicky and Holly and Justine, who are behind a curtain somewhere pulling the levers. And thank you, Torch. We are uh, delighted to be part of this big tent series. And it's a pleasure for me to be in conversation with my 
uh, friend and colleague and collaborator, Professor John Wyver. Uh, John, since I am tasked to introduce the session, I wonder whether you want to say a quick hello now. Uh, yes, hello Judith and, and uh, hello to people who are uh, listening and watching. It's a real pleasure to be here. So we thought it would be worth a session specifically on the arts in lockdown, um, because while the industry is being brutally ravaged and so many people are struggling in uh, grim and challenging ways variously, individually and collectively, it's been demonstrated, and perhaps we can also demonstrate experientially ourselves, so that participation in the arts has been really crucial for our well-being and it has proved to be a, a place where we can go to expand some of the delimitations of, um, of what lockdown has meant. So what, what have the arts done for us in lockdown? They provided a place often where we can gather around for a collective experience in ways that combat isolation, they have been a diversion from anxiety. They have somehow managed to focus anxiety or maybe channeling anxiety in other ways. They've been a, 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 a joyful tonic in challenging times and that they've offered us spaces in which we can go beyond the utilitarian. So beyond the fridge or the bed or the Zoom meeting and um, have the illusion of expansion in a moment which has perhaps been um, delimitate, uh, delimiting in various ways. And companies and organizations have of course been eager to reach out and connect with their audiences and visitors past and they hope future, making the most of the materials that they that are still shareable. And audiences have been reciprocally eager to be reached by stories and performances and productions and materials that help focus the important within the current moment, help divert us from the struggles of the current moment and perhaps also help point us to a moment that might be different from this one when we no longer Orpheus-like need to demonstrate our care for each other by perversely issuing each other. So what John and I thought we would do uh, in thinking about our own experiences of the arts in lockdown and our own reflections on lockdown, given that um, time is limited, is we think about three things briefly. And that the first would be what it means to be releasing an archive as so many companies have been doing and what it means to be on the receiving end of the release of that archive and we'll touch base with that. We're interested in, in the effects of affect and how those might um, be taking on a particular kind of acuity in this particular um, moment in which in some ways we are sharing uh, some conditions of life in ways that are un unusually, uh, there's a sort of unusual degree of commonality in perhaps ways that haven't been quite like this for 75 years. And then thirdly, uh, we think about artistic forms and what the particularities of the moment and some of the prevailing aesthetics of our life are doing uh, to prompt and enable uh, development within artistic forms. Um, and each of those will be fairly brief, but we look forward to um, then opening it up in due course and uh, taking questions and comments uh, from all of you uh, shortly as well. So, John, I wondered whether you could start by laying out some of the perspectives from which you come at, at, at this. Well, thank you, Judith. I, I wanted to say that um, I do feel quite conflicted about... Uh, really celebrating the arts in lockdown um, in this context, because uh, I realize that for so many people, the lockdown has meant uh, enormous financial hardship, dreadful suffering, and, and, and in many cases, the loss of loved ones. So it's, it's quite difficult to uh, be positive um, uh, about any, almost any aspect of, of what's happened over the last four months. But but at the same time, as I think we're going to explore, as you've just sketched, um, this has been a, a time uh, for many people, including me, of exposure to and engagement with an enormously rich range of ideas and experiments and artistic experiences, um, which have perhaps meant all the more and have been the more intense uh, because of the constraints under which we've been living and working. I've watched and deeply appreciated uh, an, an enormous range of exciting work. And I've also been fascinated to see almost, almost in fast forward, as it were, 
the emergence, I think, of new possibilities for performance on screen. And, and I guess all of that demonstrates both the resilience of the arts, um, even in these very dark days, and also our profound need for them. Thank you. And so of all the, the weight of richesse that have been coming at you, and sometimes in social media and things, one has caught the sense of breathlessness of people is that they just can't keep up with the extraordinary riches that are being tossed them in this moment of sort of heady extremity in all directions where some of those extremities, as you say, are really grim. And then some of them are an exposure to uh, things that have not been opened previously, which are now be it's becoming possible either permanently or sometimes in a delimited window to watch, which creates this sort of energy of breathlessness of, of see it now or perhaps lose it again for who, for who knows how long. Of all those richnesses that have been coming at you, what have you found most stimulating or illuminating or that has taken your breath away? Uh, well, I think we have to recognize that um, the emergency has given us, if nothing else, Hamilton the movie, um, uh, at least for those fortunate enough to have Disney Plus. Um, you know, it was a, a stage version that has been filmed that wasn't meant to be released until late next year uh, and is now available in, in many homes. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's been an extraordinary richness of uh, productions from the National Theatre and also from the Royal Shakespeare Company, a number of which I've been involved in the production of, which have been and, in, and indeed still are available on BBC iPlayer and have been playing on, on BBC Four. Uh, but I've seen things that I kind of never expected to see. You know, I've seen um, Stockhausen's Mitvok from Birmingham Opera. I've seen their uh, remarkably good um, uh, production of, of uh, Tippett's The Icebreak uh, on film. Uh, I've seen um, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice's Joseph and His Amazing Technicolor Greencoat. Um, I've seen Hamlet from Dortmund. I've seen uh, the Thalia Theatre uh, in Hamburg's Hamlet Machine. I've seen Katie Mitchell's Orlando from the, the Schaubrunner in, in, in Berlin. And I've seen an amazing array of silent film, with, often with live accompaniment from the Kennington Bioscope. You know, one of the, one of the most remarkable things is a 1912 um, French film uh, called Love and Science, which um, is a kind of early version of television. You know, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, prescient vision of the future. I guess the, the one thing that I've been more astonished and delighted and surprised about um, is uh, a uh, 1957 recording uh, for East German television of the Berliner Ensemble's uh, Mother Courage and Her Children. Um, this is a production, it's, it's the production that Brecht uh, wrote and directed in 1949 as the premiere production for the Berliner Ensemble. Um, and it's the production that came to Britain uh, in 1956 and was so influential on the future of, of British theatre. Nobody knew this recording existed. I, I mean, you know, serious Breck scholars did not know this recording existed. And while it's pretty crude, it's also quite astonishing, uh, which we're just going to give you a little glimpse of. So can we play the first brief clip, please?
John, there's, there's nothing massively exciting about that as a piece of, of technologically or as a, a, a piece of sc screen art, but it captures an extraordinary cultural moment. And it's a moment that we had not thought was going to be accessible to us and has become accessible because because companies have been trawling their own archives and saying, what can we give the public since we can't give them the thing that we would normally give them and that they would normally be craving? What compensatory this and that can we offer? And that this and that in this particular case is this extraordinary cultural document. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's remarkable to see it for all its simplicity and uh, immediacy. It's got some of the qualities, it seems to me, of... Uh, the silent film um, and the silent film of uh, theatrical productions that you've done so much to explore and engage with. Um, so it looks back in some senses to 50 years or 60 years, um, but it also I think absolutely looks forward. It's, you know, it's three cameras, it's very crude black and white um, recording, but nonetheless it's essentially the technique that the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company use to translate their stage productions to cinemas and, and now to home screens in the lockdown. And there's no little bit of you that feels that it is a breach in the contract of what theatre is, that it might still endure to be accessible and viewable in any form at a moment beyond its own moment after the final curtain. No, I, you know, I know the argument that says theatre can only exist in a moment and it's absolutely dependent on simultaneous co-presence. You have to be in the same space with the actors at that moment. And I, I absolutely respect that. And, and, you know, some of the most magical theatrical experiences of my life have absolutely been about that. But I also think that we should have a broader, more expansive sense of what theatre is and that um, ideas of engaging with texts, with actors, with bodies, with experiences taking place in front of us can happen uh, in recorded forms, in mediated forms, on screens, and, and in a myriad of other ways. And uh, I find that very exciting. To, to shut down those possibilities seems to me far too limiting. Yes, and the enforced domesticity that has been wished on all of us has, has generated its own sort of appetites and that those appetites have also been um, being fed by the kind of choices that companies are making about what, about what they release. And in the midst of all that, there's been an enormous weight of Shakespeare. There's been a, a, a great prevalence of, of Shakespearean release so that the Shakespeareans amongst our, our friends and colleagues variously have, have been uh, foremost among those who've been breathlessly trying to keep up, keep up with the goodies as they, as they emerge each time. Um, and I wondered whether you had any thoughts about why we might have been reaching for or why it might be thought we might want to reach for so much Shakespeare at such a moment. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I wonder how much that is our as the, as the audience collectively, our desire for that and how much in effect it's, it's supply led. It's the fact that, um, you know, Shakespeare takes such a central place in the production offerings of so many companies, both on stage, but also uh, almost, uh, you know, to, to a greater degree in terms of what is, uh, mediated and presented on the screen. Um, so in a sense, there's a lot of Shakespeare in the archives and there ain't very much Marlowe or Sheridan or even Shaw, honestly. So, uh, you know, it's partly from that end. And that of course reflects the centrality that Shakespeare has in uh, our national tradition, but in other countries, uh, cultural traditions as well, notably in, in Germany for a whole range of historical reasons. Um, it would, it, it's exciting to see some of the radical work that is done with Shakespeare uh, beyond the, the mainstream traditions in Britain. And, and um, that's certainly the case. Um, of, or we've been exposed to that in a, in a greater way, I think. Uh, because of uh, the, the riches that have been available in our, in our homes in the past weeks. 
Thank you. Uh, because uh, the time is moving on, I'm going to crack on to what we have designated the second of our little mini explorations and that I'm going to lead off on, on this one, which is about frames and the importance of frames and also um, about affect, about the emotional punch um, that, that things can have on us and maybe with a particularity about the moment. So lockdown has been necessarily but painfully about the containment of us within our own spaces and we're faced with a clear and constant metaphorizing of that all day every day in how we appear to each other in Zoom and Teams meetings. So the meaning of a frame and of how a frame works to contain and to exclude, to offer boundaries around and to invite conversations across is on our mind constantly because it's in our field of vision constantly. And it's become the default building block for new productions also as artists and characters pass lines to, to one another or sing their SATB parts or navigate their own collaborative encounters variously across the mini boxes that have become the organizing principle of our lives, regulating and containing, but also making possible to the degree to which they can. So, so accustomed are we to the containment of the frame that the moments that seem to then challenge that, I have found fundamentally affecting since they catch at a deep craving to be able to hug my mum and eat soup with my bereaved friend and hold the hand of the anxious and just be with other people in the multiplicity of ways in which we all do that. So for example, in a scene from Creation Theatre's The Tempest, um, it's an online production which has caused a little stir uh, variously and has garnered a certain amount of attention. There's a moment when Ferdinand, uh, who's in his own sort of mini lockdown, uh, shifting logs that Prospero has imposed upon him and Miranda want to reach out for each other. So from their own separate uh, little, little boxes, there is a hand reaching out in one direction and there's a hand reaching out in the other direction. And it's, it's self-consciously comic because we're sitting at home knowing that they won't be able to reach across those boxes. And then uh, the little conceit is pulled and Ferdinand is, is suddenly full frame and uh, a female hand uh, reaches into the frame and he is able to hold it and it catches us. It catches us because it defies what we had thought was possible. It's a tease about possibility and escape. Um, and of course, we know that it's a duplicitous tease that little sister or partner or somebody has been cajoled from within Ferdinand's own space of lockdown to supply a hand as a substitute for Miranda's. And that we also know that fundamentally no actual hand can substitute for any other actual hand and that uh, nobody else can be my mum or my bereaved, you know, that actually you're either with them or you're not. And that those kind of substitutes are um, a, a fun conceit. Um, but it also plays to something that is a very deep craving. And it also enables something, it sort of metaphorizes something, it emblematizes something that is, is true of those artworks in relation to us as well, and that they're inviting us to try and reach out beyond those frames to make a connection. And that actually they can be higher or lower quality proxies for that reaching of hands across the lockdown spaces. Um, but that it's, it's even good to have it acknowledged as something that is a shared aspiration. So I'm interested, as I know John is too, um, about how the image of a frame within the frame of our own screen uh, then relates to the history of screen arts variously. And my own interest is in specifically about how those internal frames invite us to fantasize about the breaching of the frame and how this also relates to the very earliest moments of cinema um, how and how early cinema fantasized about breaching frames and how frequently it in fact and how genericized it became and um, that that was happening um, very often. There's a, a sort of joke about what cinema was and about what containment might be. But also this brings us to um, the particularity and the beauty of our next clip, which is the short film that the um, Opera Nationale de Paris, the amazing ballet company that's based at the Palais Garnier, and um, the Opera Bastille put out to advertise their own dances in lockdown. This was a, we're still here, that we're not able to perform and we're not able to invite you into our space anymore, but, um, but we're here and we're still dancing in our own spaces. And there's something that's peculiarly touching about being invited into their own domestic spaces with their toddlers 
uh, coming in and out of frame and their washing sometimes visible and their beautiful balconies and their ordinary balconies and their amazing art on the wall and their nothings on the wall and the variety of how they are living variously. We're going to pick it up um, towards the end, I think about two thirds of the way in, and that we'll just run it from there through to the very end. And thank you to those who are now going to play it for us. So apart from the fact that a good burst of Prokofiev and beautiful bodies doing beautiful things is always um, a, a treat, what catches you about that, John? It's the surprise, of course, isn't it? You know, the, the sense that we've sat through five minutes of exquisite dance of bodies within the frame, sometimes within the same frame, but not connecting across the frame. And then a moment of, of pause and stillness at the end where we think those two dancers, even though we've seen them together before, we think that they're in different worlds. We think that they are in worlds as different from each other as they are from us. And then by this kind of simple, beautiful uh, wipe across the screen, um, you know, a, a trick that Melies might have used 120 years ago, as it were, they are brought together in the same space and, and embrace. It's, it's incredibly touching, I think. It is, and, that because we, it, and it works because it assumes that we know the grammar of what, uh, what those separate bodies, those separate little windows of information on the screen are and do, and that they occupy their own uh, integral space and that their own integrity is unbreached. And then it turns out that these two can reach across it and then they melt into the most beautiful hug, which is the expression of everything all of us want, that all of us want to be able to get out of this and say the lovely thing and do the lovely thing and be with in a real spirit of uh, utter melty withness each other in a way that we have been necessarily but painfully prevented from doing. Um, but that it is also that that's the first thought, isn't it? The first thought is, ah, oh, yes, that is that's breaching the grammar and it's, and it's realizing that craving and that aspiration, but it's not actually a magic trick. Those two are in each other's lockdown space anyway. So it's lovely to see the hug, but it hasn't actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a, a teasing um, realization that we still haven't escaped it. We'd love to, but that actually there are other spaces in which there are people in each other's lockdown spaces. So that it's both beautiful and uh, realizing an aspiration and capturing an aspiration, but also reinforcing the realization that we are still delimited to whoever we're in our lockdown spaces um, with, which yeah, I can see in yours and my cases is just lots of book bookcases, it turns out. Um, what do you think about how um, the, the sort of the dominant aesthetic of how we live our lives in these little um, bo boxes of information and the way in which new work is coming out uh, riffing on that 
and necessarily um, uh, dependent on that in many ways, both to draw attention to it and to try and stretch it and challenge it, to try and uh, do everything one can to breach without breaching. Um, the, the little duplicitous shimmies about breaching or about expanding or extending or moving frames around in more and more innovative ways. How is that um, settling down into something that is both a sort of progressive but also regressive, in catching, catching other things that have maybe fallen into abeyance that were modish in their moment, but that filmmakers or um, television makers have not been embracing, but that they, they had their moment, or indeed something that might become something of an aesthetic that might stick. Yeah, I, I mean, at, at the first level, we've all got more used than we would have wished to um, the aesthetic of the formal um, strategy of a Zoom call of a, or a Teams meeting. Um, and that's been carried across into some very successful uh, dramas and performance works. Um, the BBC One series staged with David Tennant and Michael Sheen is a complete delight in the way in which it uses um, the, the conceit of Zoom calls between the two actors and their a hapless writer-director to uh, work through a whole bunch of questions about um, the theatre, about pretense, uh, about character, um, you know, all framed within a, a notional uh, performance of a Pirandello play, Pirandello play uh, which of course um, are exactly the concerns that Pirandello's drama was engaged with uh, in, the, in the interwar years. Um, uh, we've seen other other uses of the Zoom called the W1A um, initial lockdown meetings, a kind of hilarious, um, you know, reworking of the embarrassments and the hideousness of of Zoom as a technology and the meeting of of those people. Um, I think what I've been interested to see and what I think is still developing incredibly rapidly is a move beyond that idea that the drama is using uh, Zoom as a form, um, but uh, which is starting to work with multiple screens, split screens, ideas of montage within the space of the screen, editing, if you like, within the screen, uh, simultaneously rather than uh, conventional linear editing with one shot after the other. You and I both know that there's a whole history but quite a kind of um, hidden or, or, or um, you know, it's, it's not a mainstream history of filmmakers working with split screens and frames within frames from, as you say, the silent period through uh, Abel Gance's Napoleon is, a, is an obvious example. Um, a whole bunch of filmmakers in the 60s and 70s uh, working with split screens, whether that's in a concert film like Woodstock or, or John Frankenheimer's Grand Prix and so forth. But it's never, it's never the dominant form for narrative or performance. The, the dominant form is single full frame storytelling where one image follows another. Um, a sense of transparency, uh, a sense of the form itself not calling attention to itself, you know, uh, withdrawing, becoming invisible as it were. Um, but with some of these performance works now, um, with the way in which orchestras are presenting, um, you know, very elaborate pieces of music uh, across 20, 30, 40 musicians in different screens, um, or some of the dance work, um, the, the Juilliard's uh, Bolero, for example, is a, is a wonderful example of that. Um, and longer form um, uh, uh, drama as well. You mentioned the creation uh, theatre's um, Tempest. Uh, one of the things that I'd be most impressed with is the uh, Theatre for a New Audience's production of um, Carol Churchill's Mad Forest, which worked with Zoom, but, but reworked that technology 
in a very sophisticated way to make something that I thought was extremely effective and affecting. Um, so I think people are not, as it were, just grounding uh, what they're doing in a Zoom call, an ersatz Zoom call, as it were, but they're opening up possibilities of using screen space in, in new ways for narrative drama and for, particularly because it's what we're interested in, uh, performance. And I think perhaps we may see uh, those possibilities extended and developed as the constraints that this is being uh, produced under now begin perhaps to, we hope, um, uh, you know, ease and offer the opportunity for people to uh, go back to something like what we what we had before, but maybe now with a an enhanced palette, maybe now with a greater sense of experiment and innovation and, and possibility. I'd like at least to think that that's the case. And it does, of course, create a, a different mode of viewing, doesn't it? If you are moving purely sequentially from one shot to the next, if instead you have uh, a simultaneity of shots available to you and a sort of dizzying riot of possibilities about where your center of attention should be. It creates a different kind of path of synthesizing and of generating relationships, of relationships between one space and another being suggested, but also being created in the spaces of reception. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I think there's a, a an argument to be made that that kind of mental editing, that sense in which you have to bring these different spaces, uh, these different um, images together simultaneously, is a different kind of viewing experience. Maybe a viewing, a different, a, a form of viewing experience that gives you as the viewer a greater sense of control, a greater sense of, you know, being being in charge of what is happening here and your relationship to it and maybe that sense of control is a you know is a solace in a in a world where there is so much else that we are utterly unable to control maybe that's too fanciful but i but it certainly i think you know what this sort of mental editing offers to the viewer is a, at least a kind of new, fresh, distinctive way, which may offer us new ways into Shakespeare or, or a whole range of other um, theatrical uh, and, and dramatic experiences. Yes, uh, new, fresh, innovative in all those things you say, and also recuperative of things that have been done in the past, but recuperative and speaking into a moment where the relationship of one space to another carries with it its own particular kind of um, acute charge as we are living our own relationship of one space to another purely um, through the screen, or a little bit less so now, but that at uh, the moment when we decided to do this session, uh, the relationship of one space to another was purely accessed um, via the screen. And so we're, it seems appropriate that we should have done this session, even though there was just an option to have done it in real space, in shared space, uh, three-dimensional space that we've um, that we've used the little boxes of information and we've contained ourselves within those frames in order to do so. Wes, I think you are lurking somewhere. And if people have been feeding in questions, I think this might be the moment when it would be appropriate to hand back to you. Yes, I'm no longer lurking. I'm here. And people have indeed been um, feeding in questions. Um, and the questions are coming in from all sorts of different perspectives, although your the, the three sort of pointers you gave at the beginning about archive, um, affect, and then the question of the frame, I think has been has been um, fundamental to the way people have been following you and thinking about uh, what you've been talking about. Perhaps I can start um, just by not so much um, knocking things on the head, but addressing an anxiety that people have um, at the beginning. And that's, um, somebody put it most eloquently by, with reference to the song Video Killed the Radio Star, um, which is, has all of this um, making things available, opening up the archive, getting used to watching stuff on screen, killed live theatre? 
So this is a question which has perhaps become more potent in lockdown, but it's, it's not generated by lockdown. And I know that John is somebody who is uh, running a large operation about live theatre broadcast will have had this put to him many times, that we're, and particularly from companies who have some national and international recognition, whether beaming those things into all corners of the world is actually um, uh, tolling the death knoll for local um, theatre. John, this is not a new question to you, um, but that let, let us put it to you to start with. Um, no, it's not going to kill live theatre period. <laughs> um, it's, it's a complex enhancement of it, which enters the ecology of, of theatre in, in different ways, I think. Um, although it's had a greater prominence over the last 10 years, adapting uh, theatre, dance, opera for the screen, um, you know, there's a long tradition and history of this. Um, both in live and recorded forms, going back indeed to the beginnings of silent cinema, and in some ways, um, you know, almost going back before that in in other media forms, in lantern slides or photographs or whatever. Um, none of that's killed live theatre. Um, I think that uh, th there are, but there are very, you know, subtle and complex questions about what gets done, who pays for it, how it gets distributed, and what impact, if any, that has on cannibalizing elements of the, of the theater ecology. Yeah. Um, an ecology that's going to be incredibly fragile as we come out of this. And I think there's a lot of you know, very careful and cautious thinking to be done about what place um, screen versions of theatre have within, within that ecology. Um, and I don't have any of those answers, but I think it's a, you know, it's a set of questions that people in companies, large and small, are acutely aware of and are going to take very seriously, uh, you know, as we, as, as, as the next months unfold. There's, there's absolutely no aspiration on the part of the major companies who are able to produce live theatre broadcasts to displace or, re or replace live theatre at a local level. But you can understand, one can completely understand the nervousness from the perspective of the local theatre producers that something that has um, a, a different kind of scale of money behind it um, that yeah. might. But they are occupying different kind of cultural spaces, and that cinema didn't displace theatre. No, there is no, no. About live horizon of shared presence that is never going to be replaced by, by this interesting hybrid form. I'm sure that's right. And John talks about an ecology and of course ecology and economy in, these, uh, in this field is, is very, is sort of overlapping because of course, uh, and, and one of the other questions that's come through is how do we move to the point where we start to, um, the question doesn't put it this way, but I will monetize this um, uh, so that people can actually earn a living uh, again um, uh, by, if not performing live uh, necessarily all the time, but you know, this is people's work. Um, how do we get to a, a point where um, the labor and the cost and the effort is actually, um, yeah, represented in the way that people consume this without turning all those people away. It's part of your question about Hamilton. You know, yes, it's great that Hamilton's out there, but you have to pay quite a bit to be part of Disney Plus. Oh, indeed. So, you know, uh, what do we do about that? Have you any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, it's absolutely the case that uh, this, that work should not be simply translated across into another form without appropriate uh, rights agreements being in place and payments being made and royalties being um, returned back to the makers. I, I can only speak a little uh, for the experience of the RSC, but uh, when we put the, the um, screen versions together for the RSC, there's a very careful and precise uh, contract for the cast and the musicians and uh, the creative team, which permits wonderfully wide distribution of this work, 
but ensures that a percentage of the revenue that's created goes back to the people who created it onto the, on the stage. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, absolutely essential for any way forward in, 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 this, uh, in this form. What's certainly the case is that doing this work to a high standard and paying for rights and being appropriate in the way in which these 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 productions are put together is expensive mm -hmm. and um, much of the work that's been done to date has been done because of in the investment by the RSC or the National Theatre or others in this work for the future and for this work to be then used in education and elsewhere um, there isn't a, a simple, self-sustaining model for making screen work at a high creative level at the moment. Mm. And uh, again, I think it's an urgent issue for people to address um, as we come out of this to try to find ways in which that can be sustaining um, and allow the creation of screen versions of a much wider range uh, of productions than um, you know stage spe stage pieces done on the South Bank and and in Stratford. And as soon as we're all able to, and we're allowed out, and they're allowed open, we all need to scamper back gratefully and supportively yes. to our local um, theatres. Yeah, I should acknowledge that my the first question about monetizing, or as I put it, came from uh, Dan Norman. Um, there's another Dan, Daniel Harding, who says Mittwoch and the ice break were brilliant, an unexpected plus of lockdown. And somebody else has said, um, what's the best production you've seen during lockdown? And by production, they're being quite specific. In other words, something not recorded beforehand, but made now. So we're moving into a slightly different zone now. In other words, not, not, yeah, what, what is it? It's what you touched on, both of you, at the end of your uh, uh, the discussion as to ways in which lockdown might be actually producing new kinds of performance, new kinds of experience. I don't know who wants to take that first. I'll, I'll go first. Um, okay. But the, all I'm going to reference is a, a local uh, production that we did in St. Peter's here of Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> It wasn't aspiring to uh, professional anything. It was about the joy of participation. And I think there has been quite a lot of evidence that actually participating in something for the joy of it and doing it together, making something together um, has extraordinary benefits on well-being. And certainly we found that to be joyously true as we collectively got our silly on and, um, and produced and some nights do together. And I think you, we also see that in things like the the Getty Museum Challenge at home, where people are going to extraordinary lengths in order to reproduce famous paintings and that those two things can then be um, uh, disseminated along, alongside each other. And it is joyous and it is you know, pointless on, in, in some ways and utterly purposeful in other mm -hmm. ways. So about mm -hmm. I would, I would talk about the joy of participation at this point, but over to John for some more. Well, before John jumps in, just to say that as often happens, actually, the, the questions are sort of anticipating or responding to what you're saying. And somebody, Alice O'Grady, has said, is it then time to reassess the significance of collectivity in cultural practice? Is one of the things that we've learned precisely that what you call participation, but what she calls collectivity, is an important part of what this is all about? Um, this and in all things actually that we've all learned something about togetherness by being apart and mm -hmm. how importantly it sits with all of us and how necessary it is to the human condition and what extravagant lengths we will go to in order to be together mm -hmm. apart and to do things together while apart so yes mm -hmm. Alice. John I stopped you before you might um, give your account of something that's particularly good that we should look out for or <laughs> simply that's now gone. I, I was going to say that sense of collectivity is, is very important and um, I think it has been sharpened and heightened in, in many ways by what we've been going through and I think you can see that reflected in some ways on in terms of what television for example has been offering so you know Sewing Bee has, has seen its uh, audience uh, rocket um, because of the ways in which people have been creating alongside that show 
um, the, uh, the BBC and Sky ha have both been doing um, uh, online life classes for people to uh, paint from or draw from at home and then contribute their work uh, online. And, and I think, you know, those, those things are uh, being sharpened and extended by, by the lockdown in really interesting ways and in ways that also reflect and resonate with the way in which I think you know, much more broadly through, for example, the way in which the Arts Council is thinking about the place of the arts in our lives and moving much more to uh, something that is about um, you know, creativity by everybody as a, as a fundamental principle for culture. Um, just in terms, of, I mean, I mentioned what I think is the most uh, impressive new work. It was a piece that apparently was being rehearsed for the stage, um, but then got translated into an enhanced Zoom environment, which is um, the Theatre for a New Audience and Bard College's production of Carol Churchill's Mad Forest, her, mm -hmm. her play about the Romanian Revolution. Um, I thought it was kind of brilliantly inventive, formally, um, but also it spoke to me out of the screen about politics and relationships and history and memory um, in, a, in a way that, you know, I found extremely powerful. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we could just dwell for another moment with this notion of collectivity. And so Nicole Thompson, who's an MA student at Leeds and also a creative practitioner, says, how can we better highlight and support community concepts of creativity alongside the professional focus? Because that's another thing that it seems to me, well, not only me, but clearly Nicole as well, lockdown has, has kind of shown is that there's an awful lot of really interesting community work going on. Um, I don't know what thoughts you have about how that might, I mean, you've just mentioned that the, the Arts Council's kind of new imperative, but there's also obviously this famous amount of money that's now been given to, whether it's the Jewel in the Crown or community stuff. I, have you thoughts on that, either of you, about the, the sort of, we're moving, if you like, from collectivity to community, uh, and, and if you like, not just professional theatre, I think the local has become much more important. We've started shopping for our neighbours and uh, doing all those things that we didn't think we needed to do or that we, you know, en masse, but there has been an, an eye out for each other because we have stood and clapped next to each other, etc. There has been a sense of the importance of the local, which has also generated all sorts of good things locally across localities, and the arts should be absolutely part of that um, as part of our care for and work with each other where the local matters. So um, I'm with... Nicole on this, I'll let it thrive. So John, as somebody who works with the RSE, are we all going to have a different understanding of the local there too? I'll come back to, to how other things in RSE might change in a minute. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I mean, it's, it's a question that the RSE clearly does already work a good deal in, in a number of different local ways, but it's more that the sort of um, the professional and the non-professional as a kind of performance space, yeah. uh, if I'm making sense here. Again, I'm cautious about speaking for the, you know, the artistic um, uh, direction of the company, but I think sure. it's absolutely the case that um, the company, like many other theatre companies, is very grounded in education and works with a huge number of schools across the country to um, develop uh, skills and understanding and confidence and, and so forth. It has a number of uh, partnerships with regional theatres, professional theatres certainly, um, and it's explored and engaged with working with um, amateur companies as well. I mean, um, uh, Erica Wyman's uh, mm -hmm. product Midsummer Night's Dream, which collaborated with amateur theatre companies across the country and brought those companies into um, the Stratford environment, as well as going out to those companies to play uh, between, as it were, you know, defined professionals and self-defined amateurs is, mm -hmm. a, is a fascinating model for how um, this kind of work can be developed and, and extended. Uh, where every, where everybody, of course, is desperate 
for um, a better understanding of how the uh, much vaunted 1.57 billion pounds is going to be spent across the arts and museums and galleries and performance in general. Um, I think that uh, there is a deep awareness of the importance of uh, these issues, issues of diversity, issues of accessibility uh, within the Arts Council and the other um, cultural bodies that are going to be involved in working out how to uh, use, invest and, and, and employ this money in the best way possible for the future. Thank you. Judith, do you want to add anything there? Only, only that um, it's, it would be easy to slip into a, a, the thinking that somehow the national slash international and the local were antithetical, but actually the kind of ways in which John's been pointing to some of the, the locally based work of the, the Royal Shakespeare Company problematizes that model where they're, they're not yeah. antithetical, but they, there are wonderful things that need to spring up and that are springing up all over the place at local yeah. level. Also, um, some of these national and international companies are also doing terrific things locally. Yeah, I'll do a little plug for our own series here. Erica, of course, was one of the first people in the series, uh, in the Big Tent series. So if, you, if people haven't seen that, you can go back to one of the early series and, and hear what some of what she has. This, this was a question that came up there. Um, I'd like to shift the, the, the frame a little bit now. Um, one of our um, questioners um, asked, um, let me see who it was. Um, Shrigi Dash says, how have the arts, so, so building out a bit more from just theatre for a minute, how the arts found its way to help people previously in times of academic, uh, sorry, epidemic. Um, it's exhausting to think of this as a world without theatre. Um, do you have a kind of historical view on this? Um, previous academic epidemics, we've, we've talked about this also in previous um, sessions, but I wondered if you have a, uh, a thought beyond theatre, because there's a question or two about television coming up as well. So should be drawing down on some of the expertise that was uh, that was fed into previous sessions in that case and I am regretting not having seen that one um, uh, so no I, I can't really speak about this apart from obviously the thing one always reaches for uh, what happens when the theatre closes Shakespeare writes sonnets you know and um, that right. it does generate its own sort of mode of a prompt to other forms of creativity as uh, depending on where the delimitations are and where the possibility is then seen John John, do you have anything to add here? Okay, well, in that case, I'll ask the, the, uh, a version of that, which is the television question from Daniel Harding. Are we seeing the start of a new television culture, which is actually about directly engaging, engaging audiences in real time instead of passive viewing? Um, and he says, this is the original reason why I insist on these being live rather than filmed and released. So uh, does that question make sense to you? And do you does yeah, it, do you, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, television culture is grounded in liveness. Um, mm -hmm. Until 1953, all television in Britain was live and there was no possibility of uh, recording and, and reviewing. And, and even for the next 20 years, it took, it took um, a long time for uh, the majority of programming to become um, recorded. Still clearly key uh, forms of television, the news and, and sports are the obvious examples, mm -hmm. uh, but elements of, of reality television as well um, depend on, uh, I, on, on liveness in, a, in an absolutely fundamental way. I think what we are seeing is the emergence of um, a whole host of ways of engaging with television in hybrid forms between traditional broadcasting, streaming, and different forms of social media. Um, and I think that's, that's very exciting. And even, you know, on Sunday, um, uh, Christopher Luscombe's uh, production of Much Ado About Nothing, which we uh, recorded, did a screen version of in, in Stratford for the Royal Shakespeare Company in 2016. Um, that's been on iPlayer for the last three months or so. It was shown on BBC Four and Chris and the composer Nigel Hess um, uh, tweeted alongside it, um, extending and engaging with uh, audience questions and responses and deepening um, the enjoyment and the and the learning that was available to to audiences and i think we'll certainly see 
much more of, of those kinds of hybrid forms developing. That too is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And what that also does is it can create, a, if we're all watching it at the same time and it's happening then, is it can create a community of respondents yeah. who can reach each other laterally as well as uh, responding forward to the thing in front of them. So all these lovely watch-along parties where people are um, uh, sharing and, and comparing and testing their own responses in real time. It's also a celebration of multiplicity, that actually mm -hmm. we are so used to multiplicity of input now that we can be working our own responses at the same time as we are taking multiple inputs from um, some of the material that's in front of us. And that that's a cause for celebration. And it's almost like we're, our restlessness doesn't like the singularity anymore. We like to have the, the multiple inputs and we want the commentary at the same time as the thing. We want to be able to make our own commentary and to be responding to other people's commentary. We want the chat bar at the same time as the Zoom meeting. And that yep. be, but actually the speed of response and input is um, ever accelerating. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what all of that does is reinvent ideas of liveness, it seems. Yes. It becomes um, not essential that you are watching at exactly the same moment as something is taking place on the stage in Fratford but that you are watching a recording which is at the centre of a community of people who are contributing, questioning, engaging, offering their opinions in a live form. And uh, that, that too seems exciting and interesting and, and distinctive. Yeah, I wrote down two different accounts of liveness that you offered. John, you had simultaneous co-presence at one point. Um, and Judith, you had utterly melty withness with each other. Um, so <laughs> I think that, the, well, I think those two of those are both accounts of liveness from a sort of phenomenological perspective yeah. in a way. And it brings me to the last week. We're nearly running out of time, but it seems to me we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, and the first is um, actually was one of the first questions asked, which is, um, so when we get back into the theatres and when theatre makers get back into the theatres, are we going to have a different kind of theatre whereby what was previously avant-garde, you know, Worcester group type stuff or some of Katie Mitchell's sort of more um, uh, extreme, I mean, I love it, but extreme stuff, whereby the split focus, the split screen, the, 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 the editing that's going on on stage, um, electronic mediation, etc., will be more embraced by theatre makers, do you think? In other words, will the avant-garde move more into the mainstream because we've now understood that people can live with that and appreciate that? I, d I don't know whether that will happen. I certainly think the connections between what we've been talking about, um, you know, in terms of multiple screens and so forth, um, have, has a lot of resonance with what Katie Mitchell or Ivo van Hove and, yeah. and others have been doing on the stage. That kind of intermedial approach is, is fascinating. But again, you know, not that new. Um, you know, there's a there's a interwar Ivan Novello musical that uh, features television on the stage and um, it's not completely clear how it was realized, but there was this, clearly the integration of a screen within an absolutely mainstream piece of musical theater. Um, what I do think may happen and what I would welcome is the greater engagement or the, a greater dialogue between theater producers, creators, um, and screen creators and producers. I think certainly my experience has been that while there are a number of, of directors and designers and others who are very interested in what that translation process is, there are a number who also feel that it's sort of not part of what they do, it's, or they don't have an entry point into it, or it just seems almost irrelevant to what actually theatre is mm -hmm. and I think maybe the enhanced awareness of screen versions and their significance will uh, encourage theatre makers and screen makers to work together uh, close in a you know in, in closer collaborations mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that could be extremely productive and exciting. Yeah I would say that um 
that we are able to celebrate the complex and the, an, an ever more intricate set of networks from which, which generate their own synthesis, need for synthesis um, in the receiver. But at the same time as that, uh, it kind of speed of synthesis being required. In some ways, that also makes us fall back on the startlingly simple, the startlingly true, the startlingly human. And, and perhaps if we could just go back to that final moment in the um, the op, the uh, opera de Paris, um, the final moment in the, in the ballet where the, the music starts, we don't get Prokofiev crashing chords, a wonderful runs up and down, and that the, the bar which had seemed to divide two people is gone and two people give each other a real hug without boundaries. And there's something so true and so human and so unadorned about the simplicity of that truthfulness that I think we will always want that too. That seems like a good note to end on, but I just wanted to say, uh, to pick up really on what John just said about some of this not being new, because it seems to connect, it seems to me with what you were saying, Judith, about the Shakespeare stuff as well, whereby much of what, uh, people are working with let's say in the tempest in the in in the um creation version which you know i have to say i rather like um I, 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 in all sorts of ways um it partly because it does do what you said said it does in other words it brings out things which are already emblematized in the tempest itself the questions of conceit the questions of what is touch are you really there or not you know in a sense there's already a television screen on stage in the Tempest, isn't there? Um, so in a way, this is nothing new and it is about the human, but of course we're reinventing it um, all the time. Um, and I, I, I suppose that's the last question is the Shakespeare question. Um, and maybe it's a question for Judith, but it's also a question for John. Why do we keep reaching back to Shakespeare um, uh, at times like this? Is it because of, you know, national education? Is it, um, what is it? Uh, yeah, why, why Shakespeare? What, what's what's the touchstone here? John, do you want to go first? Oh, sorry, Judith, go first. You want to go first, John? Oh, no, you, you you do this one. Shared, shared cultural reference um, is really important because it means that we one can be ergonomic in getting to things quickly. That actually, quite often, one can trust the fact that one will know the story or one will know the dynamics, and so one can get to the thing one wants to do with it with a sort of performative efficiency that is available because we know the territory. And of course, it's pretty good too. John, do you want to add to that? I don't, I don't think so. I, I think, um, you know, there's, one can only, only add sort of cliches to that, the richness, variety, the extraordinary achievement of it. But I also think that as I, as I tried to suggest, the certainly in a screen environment, um, one wishes that people could look uh, um, more strongly and positively beyond that to find mm -hmm. other riches in you know, the extraordinary repertoire of, of uh, English drama and international drama. Yeah, yeah. OK, well, thank you so much, um, both uh, of our brilliant speakers. Uh, Professor Judith Buchanan and Professor John Wyver for a wonderful and thought-provoking session. Um, thank you to the viewers at home for watching, for your comments, for your questions, and indeed for joining in this experiment in, in collectivity that, that we have here. Um, I also want to stress, as Judith did right at the beginning, that the Big Tent series would not be possible without the support, as it were, backstage of the fantastic Torch team. Uh, thank you all then, and thank you specifically one last time, John, and thank you also, Judith. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Everyone else, although John and Judith are welcome too, please join us again next Thursday, 16th of July at 5 p.m. for the next installment of our Big Tent live event series, which will instead, in fact, be live streamed from a very special Oxford venue. You'll have to turn up next week to find out where we are. We will be joined by Dr. Alex Lloyd from the Modern Languages Department and uh, my own college, St. Edmund Hall, and Tom Herring, director of Sansara Choir, who will be discussing their collaboration, White Rose, Voices of the German Resistance, as part of next week's Activism Week. White Rose, Voices of the German Resistance, is a collaboration between the White Rose Project, led by Alex Lloyd and Sansara. In 1943, five students and a professor at the University of Munich were executed. They had been part of the White Rose, a group that called on Germans to resist Hitler. 
This project combines the two performances, forces of the spoken word and a cappella choral music to tell this remarkable story. It really is worth turning up to listen to, and we hope you'll be able to join us again. But for now, thank you for coming from Colombia, from India, from all over the UK and from the US. Once again, thank you and goodbye.